Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday. I just had to step out and grab my water. I left it in my, in my pickup. And I think it's already 100 degrees. So I hope you all made it through the week okay. It's hot. And we still have a few more days of it, so make sure you're taking care of yourselves. If you would, please join me in song this morning. Lord, we come before Thee now, at Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain, shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on Thee our souls depend, in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with Thy rich grace, tune our lips to sing Thy praise. Tune our lips to sing Thy praise. Grant that all may seek and find Thee, a God supremely kind. Heal the sick, captive free. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Morning, church. Morning. 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 There you go. So, uh, before I skip over this, that way everybody knows and you don't blame me next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to back up and start having two services again. The first one will be at 8.30, and then uh, we won't have any class. It'll run until David gets tired of talking, and then the next one will start at 10 o'clock. So we will do that because of uncertainty, don't know what our governor is going to do, and so that's the way we're going to do our church services for next Sunday. So if you see anybody that's not here today, if they show up at 10, we'll still be here. But if you want to show up early and beat the heat, well, we'll be here for that one too. Other than that, uh, change Sunday uh, is the day. It will be going to the New Mexico Christian Children's Home. We have another box. If you'll notice back there on the back on this side, Willie's back there by it, but we're going to have one on each side. That's where we will be putting our contribution moving forward. But on Change Sunday, it will be the wicker baskets sitting on the table still. Also, uh, If you hadn't noticed, if you came in, the tried to come in the back way here, we have got the breezeway closed in. This door back here will be open uh, for Wednesday night and Sunday morning. So it does have a push bar on it. So at when we start services, we can lock that door. If you need to get out, you push the bar and it will open up and let you out. But no one can come in. They should finish that project this next week. Uh, remember Wednesday night, uh, baked potatoes, chili, and chicken chili. Sounds like going to be a pretty good deal. Also, uh, Lubbock uh, Children's Home is asking for small and medium overnight uh, d diapers. So if you want to get out in the heat and go shopping well they could use that remember uh, let me see what else 
I think that's all that I've got on my list right now. If I missed anything, uh, raise your hand. Other than that, we'll go to our Heavenly Father. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for letting us have the freedom that we do to be able to come here and worship you, Lord, and and put you first. And hopefully, Lord, as we do it, we focus on the words that David will bring us today and not the worldly, worldly things that are going on outside these doors, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would be with David today as he brings us this lesson, that we will take this lesson, live it in our everyday lives. We ask that you be with our leaders of our nation. We thank you for our military that is serving here and <clears throat> across the sea, the waters, that we have the freedom to do what we're doing today. And we ask that you be with the families this last week or two, uh, the Dale Rhodes family and many others that have lost loved ones, uh, whether it's due to this virus or just normal death, Lord. We ask that you be with them and comfort them. We ask that you be with our deacons of our church here and their family. Be with the elders here, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you be with our members here. And I know there's some out there that are watching on Facebook or wherever, Lord. And and we thank you for us being able to do that to where they can listen to David's message today, Lord. Lord, I thank you for Doc, Josh for leading our songs and and everything and i just pray lord that uh what we learn here today that we take it and live it in our everyday life and hopefully lord as we're going to work or at work this week that uh maybe someone will ask us where we go to church because they like the way that we present ourselves in public we just ask that you be with us lord as we go through this service and we thank you for everything that we have because it all comes from you in jesus name amen if it's convenient for you please be standing as we continue in worship this morning You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life. King of the land and the sea, you were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down. And we worship you, Lord, we bow down, and we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life 
I've spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth, you created, all for our sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, Altogether wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'll now prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood Jesus. Not of good that I have done, 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Awesome, God, thank you so much for another day that we can come here and enjoy one another's company and be with you and, and sing your praises. Help us to reflect on the sacrifice that was, that was made for this as we take this bread. We ask all this in Jesus' name and that we take it in a manner pleasing to you. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we, we come to you thanking you so much for the blood that was shed for us that saves us and that writes our name in the book of life. Help us to take this fruit of the vine in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And as mentioned before, if you uh, wish to contribute, there are the plates in the back uh, for the uh, offering. We encourage you to do so. If it's convenient for you, please be standing for our song before the lesson this morning. I really enjoy this song. I don't know why. This is one of those ones that reminds me of when I was a kid and Dr. James and, and, and Doy Young and those guys would lead singing. I just remember this song. I love it. And the, the older I've gotten, the more I really just enjoy it myself, and I, jo I enjoy the message of it. Uh, sing to me of heaven. What's it like? Tell me about it. Tell me of its peace. The second verse, which I included this week, talks about the comrades that have gone on before, which I've talked about a lot uh, when, when I lead singing. Yesterday we went to a funeral service for our cousin Joanne Williams, uh, my dad and Greg's first cousin, my second cousin. Joanne was kind of like an aunt to us. Uh, I talk a lot about family reunions, and she was kind of the one that always organized all the banny roosters to do stuff. She kind of took it upon herself, and she had a bunch of banny roosters of her own. But we got to talking about old times. We talked about Dixie Faith. We talked about Emma Dean Mock. We talked about Buddy Mock, and it was a good time. And we got to see some people we hadn't seen in a long time. And so it was kind of funny that this song just kind of, I put this, I put this song in before I knew about Joanne's passing. And so, again, I really believe that God put this in there for us, and one day we will have that big family reunion again. And it's going to be awesome as we talk about a, a cloud of witnesses. Uh, my dad talked about the graveside yesterday, Hebrews 12. And one of these days that's going to happen. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me, it will bring release. 
Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing or my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven as I walk alone, dreaming of the comrades that so long have gone. In a fairer region among the angel throng, they are happy as they sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Amen. You may be seated. It's already been stated. We're glad that each one of you are here this morning. Hopefully that when you leave here, you will be saying, I'm glad I was here too. I know that, uh, I think I can speak for most of us this morning. <clears throat> I know that probably the majority of us, uh, concern for lack of a better term, is should we have two church services? Should we not have two? What are all of those things, all those changes that, uh, for lack of a better term, are being forced on us? Uh, that might not be the right term, but you get the drift. So again, as we said in class this morning, if you have <clears throat> concerns or opinions, be sure and let someone know. We want to take those things into consideration. We're just trying to, to be proactive before we get caught, so to speak. Uh, you don't think we'd ever do anything wrong, do you, Lolly? Not me. I know that there are, for example, there are some churches in our community that uh, have gone to doing the same thing we did and having their services on the internet or Facebook or whatever the technology piece that they use. And I know of a couple of them that when uh, that mandate came out or something along the lines of singing, that they decided what they do is they, they sing just like we do, uh, but they don't put that on Facebook. They wait and only have the sermon. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, all of us are, have our own opinions how that should work and et cetera, et cetera. And we're just kind of, in our ignorance, proceeding along. But we'll see how it all comes out when it's all said and done. One thing about it, as we all know or should know, hopefully we all believe this, is that before the foundation of the world, God knew all of this would take place. He's got a plan, and we're right in the middle of it. And there are many times, I think, that uh, from a scriptural standpoint anyway, that Weren't Jesus' immediate followers kind of going, duh, we don't understand all this, we don't like it. Aren't you going to do this today, and aren't you going to establish your kingdom today, and don't we get to sit on your right hand and be the most important part of the group? And Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, when he was in prison, what did he say? He sent his messengers to Jesus saying, boy, this plan is working out perfectly. I'm so grateful and thankful I'm fixing to be beheaded because everything's on tap for the kingdom. No. John's going, what is the deal? 
Are you, am I mixed up? Are you real? Is God in the middle of all of this? You bet he is. Do I see it? Most of the time, no. Uh, because I'm more concerned about me than I am about anything else. You've heard me say that before. you heard me say that in class today. Unfortunately, that's me. We're still in the book of Galatians in chapter 5, verse 13, 26. Lord willing, next week we'll, be, we'll, move, we'll finish this section and move on to the next section. It's so apropos, I think, for today in our world in Lovington, New Mexico at 1025. It's so apropos, and we'll deal with that in just a moment. Paul tells the Galatians, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbors yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you will not be under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, fits, a jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Now, this morning we want to look at this last slide or these last few attributes from a positive standpoint. You know, I didn't tell you, maybe you could tell, but the last two to three weeks, you know, I'm, it's, I'm I was really uncomfortable, for lack of a better term, talking about the negative side of things. And a lot of that goes from the concept or the idea from, well, you know, if I talk about these things that are culturally unpopular, for lack of a better term, what will people think? You know, if we talk about orgies or we talk about drunkenness or we talk about uh, sexual immorality, impurity, all those things, those are normal, that's the right word, in our society today as if they weren't years ago. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. Years, <clears throat> years ago, somebody read an article and talked about how it was you know, so unsafe for families to be outside after dark. How, how could it get any worse? The generation that was coming up, the teenagers of that generation were just so corrupt and, and everything that was going on, and it was just so, you know, you didn't dare didn't dare let your kids four, five, or six years old play outside without being supervised. It was dangerous to go from point A to point B and how horrible it was. And I don't remember the exact date, but it's like 1853. Things don't change. That's the world that we live in. And I think all of us, if we open our eyes, to say the least, we understand that. The problem is not understanding it. The problem is realizing that's me. I fit in there somewhere. And, you know, it's really uncomfortable to talk about. And I would pray, don't like to, but I would pray that it's offensive to us, that we, the hair on the back of our neck stand up and kind of go, well, now, wait a minute. And we'll talk about how all of that comes from Adam and Eve when they, they took of that tree that justification, that rationalization, that you don't understand, it's not my fault. That's where it all comes from. It's not new, it's not normal, or abnormal. It is normal. But the point of all of that, as we've tried to get across the last couple of weeks, is that we have a choice. Because God loved us, he gave us the choice. We have the ability to say, that's me. And AA, from what I understand, one of the first of those 12 steps was to make a fearful inventory, self-inventory, and say, that's me. I, that's why they start their meeting, supposedly, from what I understand, with, hi, my name's David, I'm an alcoholic. Hi, my name is David, I'm a crack user. 
Because until we name it and claim it, it's very difficult to deal with it or to allow God to deal with it. If I can rationalize and justify everything, what do I need a Savior for? That's the bottom line, isn't it? I need Jesus in my life. And the good news is there's bad news, and the bad news is that's me. The good news is Jesus paid the penalty. And because of what Jesus did, my life can begin to change. So that's where Paul is at. That's where we're at this morning. We're beginning to change from that negative side of things to the positive side of things, if you want to use that analogy. So Paul says there, that the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. We've made reference to this many times in the past, how that Galatians is a very short book. It's got six chapters. Romans is basically a commentary, if you want to use that term, on the book of Galatians. So Paul in Romans begins to take these very same ideas and expand them. So in Romans 7, what do we have? We've got that law passage that talks about the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things that I ought to do, I don't do. That conflict that each of us have. Each of us have. And Paul's conclusion is what? This body of death. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I cannot do it. And most of us probably in this room today have tried, haven't we? We've tried to become a, quote, better person. We've tried to become a better citizen. We've tried to become better morally, and it doesn't work, does it? At best case scenario, what happens is, is that we take off, for an example for me, I take off fits of rage, which is the act of that flesh, and I, and I take that off. David in his power, at best case scenario, is I just simply replace it with something else. Now instead of having fits of rage, now I just kind of look down my nose at everybody and say, well now Josh, this is what you need to do. And I become super critical or I become super self-righteous. I need a savior. And those of you in this room, many of you in this room, and I say it up with all sincerity and honesty. Those of you who know me, you just simply say, Amen. Boy, David needs a Savior. If anybody ever needed one, he does. Because you know me. You know my tendencies. You know how I get caught up in the wrong things. You know how I can become critical. You know how I can... The list goes on and on and, and on and on and on. I need a Savior. And I think in God's grace and in his love, one of the greatest things he ever did for us is he, quote, unquote, gave us that choice. You don't have to eat of this fruit of the tree, but you can. That is your choice, but there are consequences that follow. And in God's grace, those consequences many times are mitigated because of his love for me. But those choices are still there, and the consequences are still there. And when I finally get to the point in my life and in my relationship with Jesus that I can say, I need you in my life. I need you to help me temper that characteristic. I need to, you to help me remove that characteristic. So according to Romans 7, what does Paul say? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Because I can't. This body, this, these works of flesh are going to destroy me they're going to destroy relationships. They're going to destroy friendships. They're going to destroy everything if I don't have them dealt with, and I can't. You know, as I said earlier, isn't that the world we live in today? I mean, is there ever... Look at these two contrasting ideas where there's the work of the flesh. Where, what do you see happening? People are saying, and there's, an, there's a definite, without a doubt, there's definitely an, an, a truth in this. The prejudice that we have one toward another, race toward a brace, finances successful versus those that are, all of those prejudices that we have in our life. Now, I would pray that nobody in this room says that doesn't apply to me. 
Because it does. And if you honestly believe that, you probably are the most prejudiced person in the room. I caught myself this morning. We have a neighbor not next door, but the next one over. So this morning, before Willie came and got me, it was a little after 6, I went out and turned on the water. Well, there was a red car parked over there, and the police have been at that house several different times. So there's a red car parked in that driveway, and you know what I'm thinking? They're not the same race as me, so they're probably over there peddling drugs. That's what I think. And I'm, I'm standing out picking up my newspaper kind of going, I wonder if I ought to call Jeremiah. So I continue to kind of watch my water and watch for Willie to back out of his driveway, but I watched. And you know what they're doing? They're moving a twin-size bed. See, that prejudice that I need, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. So I have an option. I can be like that or I can have the fruit of the Spirit. I've said earlier, and I don't really believe this, but I don't know a better way to put it, that it, in a sense they're mutually exclusive. For an example, if I have fits of rage, I can have a fit of rage, but when I have that rage, do I have... Wrong screen. Do I have... Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control in a fit of rage. Are they not mutually exclusive? Involved in an orgy, sexual things control me, self-control. See how they kind of are exclusive? You can't have them both at the same time. The more you have of one, the less you have of the other. So... The good news is we have, a, we have a standard and we have a contrast that we can measure ourselves against. Where are we at? We need a Savior. So Paul says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, as we said, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have it memorized in a different translation, and so if I try to go there, I get mixed up. Those nine traits of the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about last week how that one of the things about the fruit of the Spirit is that what? That... Fruit is something that is a natural process. You notice the contrast. Here's, a lot of times we miss that. Here's the, the stark contrast of these two lifestyles. One is, quote, unquote, the work of the flesh. The other is the fruit of the Spirit. So you see, one of them is something I do. The other one is something that God does in me. That's why if I, I try to replace one and say I'm going to be better, it never works because it's me. I am the sinner. I am the one that's involved. I'm the one who's working toward that degree. I'm the one who does all the work. And not because of my heart is bent toward evil, that's where I'm going to go every time. It may not be instantaneously, but that's where it's going to take me every time. You might have heard me say this before. I need a Savior. So once we become Christians, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Correct? Now, how that looks and what that does and how the manifestations of the Spirit, we could spend a long time discussing that and or arguing about that. But I think all of us would agree that when we become Christians, God's Spirit lives within us. That's one of the promises, right? John 15, Jesus says, it's better if I leave, because if I leave another counselor, the Holy Spirit will come and live with you. So Jesus says, and I don't understand this, Jesus says, it's better for the Holy Spirit to live in you than it is for me to be physically present with you. Man, isn't that a stretch? You're going, how in the world? I don't know, but that's what he said. So it's better if God, if Jesus leaves and the Spirit comes and lives within us. So the Spirit lives within us. I think all of us, if we're Christians, we have to say, that's true. I may not understand it. I don't understand the implications of that, but it's a valid point. If God's Spirit lives in you, if, there it is, if, you've heard me say this before too, if God's Spirit lives within you, then, as we said in class today, there has to be a difference in your life. Your life has to change. Now, I say this tongue-in-cheek. You don't have an option. If you're in Jesus, your life changes, period. 
Now, we can talk about free will and God's sovereignty and all those things, and they all kind of come up like worms on a table. We'll never all get them back in the can. But this is it. I have an option. If I am a Christian, God's Spirit lives within me, and God's Spirit changes me. Or, if I'm in Jesus, God's Spirit comes into my life, and because I refuse to acknowledge that, or if I refuse to bend my will to God's will, or allow God's Spirit to change my life, what happens? Paul says this one in Thessalonians. Be careful lest you quench the Spirit. Now, personally, I believe that we, as, once we become Christians, God's Spirit becomes a deposit guaranteeing us certain things. If I refuse to do that long enough, then God's Spirit will not be active in my life. But it does not leave. And that's a debatable point, and it's a moot point in reality. If your life is not changing, it's simply because you have made choices in your life that quench or diminish the Spirit's role in your life. For an example, this one will work. I didn't think about that until Tim talked to me this morning. It's Tim's fault. He's in the back. He can leave whenever he wants to. Most of you, I mean, most of you probably know. I told Mary about that this morning. We were just laughing about it in the meeting this morning. Because Tim was saying... Well, if we just go to one service and cut class, David, what do you? What are your feelings about that? What do you think about that? How do you? Right, right. So I'm sitting there going. And Tim could see me just kind of sitting there, and he was kind of grinning, and I had to. Had, I thought for a minute, and I said, Tim, you you do realize, you do realize, you're asking me about Sunday school classes, and you do realize that I grew up in a church that said, quote-unquote, all of y'all are going to hell because you got a class. So kind of like, maybe I'm the wrong person to be talking about this. I told you that I can be very judgmental, and I can be very harsh. I remember, and maybe I ought not to go here, but I will. It's, that's what it is. I remember when years and years and years ago, I remember there was a minister here that said, don't have any, told the church here, don't have anything to do with David because he's an agent of the devil because he goes to a non-class church. And so somebody that I was supposed to meet for coffee waited until that individual was around before he would leave. I kept wondering, why is he piddling around? We're supposed to go drink coffee. Until they could see us leave together. Now, I can be led, you know, why, that's why Paul says if you keep biting and devouring each other, you're going to, yeah. See how easy that is to become those works of the flesh? You know, kind of off the subject, but Mary and I decided years ago, this, this is what changed us, changed me more than anything else. I got to thinking, you know, that I'm, I'm really involved in, voice of martyrs and persecution of the church and et cetera. And this is 30 years ago. I'm thinking one day, you know, Tim may be going to hell because he goes to a class church and I'm going to heaven because I got it right. I got it right. It's not going to be near as crowded as some people think. <laughs> but all of a sudden I got to thinking, you know, if, if, Tim ends up in one jail cell because he's a Christian proclaiming to be a Christian, a brother, erring brother, and I end up in one right beside him, I really don't think a lot of those issues are going to matter anymore. And that's becoming more true all the time in my philosophy or my theology. It's becoming more and more true. Those things we choose. So I begin to start beginning to look. And God also took us to Korea for 13 months, and many people when we came, first of all, when we went, we were told by church people, why in the world would you want to take your kids to a nation like that? How dare you? Why? Don't you love your family? Your mother's not on and on and on and on. One person encouraged us to go. One. Out of hundreds, because we were going to different churches, talking to them about the trip, etc. After 13 months, we came home, and all that's kind of his, of water under the bridge. And Mary and I left, well, I won't speak for her, David left with this in mind, and this idea in mind. I, back to that, I, We'll go to Korea, 
and convert that nation because they're heathens. And what I found out when I got back was when God converted me, he sent me back. When I learned that it's all about him, not about me, and things begin to start changing dramatically in my life. As we've used the example before, we can get so caught up in this, and I can look in the mirror, and I can say, why can't you get your life together? Why in the world, when that person pulled out in front of you, would you get so upset about it? It's not like you've never done it to somebody else, duh. But that doesn't matter, remember? It's about me. So then I begin to start beating myself up, and I begin to start saying, well, God must not love me. I must not be a Christian. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe I need to do that. And on and on and on and on. Remember what the rest of Romans 7 talks about, which is a commentary on Galatians? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ, my Lord. And the very next sentence says what? There is now, now, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Do I allow that passage to work deep within my soul and deep within my concepts and my ideas to so that I begin to start believing the truth? No condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. So the analogy I think that's the, the most vivid from is this. What is, how do we do this? We're going to start how do we do this now and we'll finish next week. How do we become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more have more forbearance, kindness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do I do that? I just simply allow God to work in my life. I said, some of us may go, well, that didn't answer the question. We'll deal with it more and develop it more. Quickly. I want to leave you kind of with this thought. I know that you've heard me say before that years ago, when our kids were younger, Mary and I always had a big garden. We had that big garden for two reasons. One is because a tomato off a tomato vine or a cantaloupe off a cantaloupe that you've planted in your yard is a whole lot better than one you get out of the store. Rocket science, right? The other reason that we had that, one of the, me, is because I had two kids that were 16 months apart and they were like eight and nine, and it was plant a garden so you can go out and work in the garden or you're going to kill them. One or the other. Well, I didn't really want to kill them. I sure thought about it. It would be convenient. but I did think a lot of times, why in the world do we do this? But anyway, that's kind of beside the point. I don't realize I'm the only parent, grandparent in this room that ever thought that. I realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we would plant our garden. And you know, don't you? You've heard me say it before. You know that we planted it last week. And I tilled it up, I'm going to till it up tomorrow because I don't have a tomato. It's been a week. What's wrong with them? Have you ever wondered why Jesus among, used agricultural parables a lot? You remember the story that right in Jesus' life, at the end of his life, he's talking about a parable of fig tree, and the guy said, we've had this fig tree, the owner said, we've had this fig tree for a long time. It's not producing any figs. I'm going to dig it up and the... the the kind of the foreman of the farm said, well, let me dig around it and fertilize it, and if it doesn't produce anything by next year, then well, let's give it one more break, so to speak. Aren't you glad that Jesus said that about you? David's not as loving and kind. He's not loving at all. Forbearance, forget it. Kindness, not even a thought. I think I'll just throw him away. And the, Jesus said, wait, wait. Let me work with him a little longer. Let me try to get him to understand this concept a little longer. And eventually, if nothing happens, nothing changes, well, we can get rid of him. Am I the only one that is dissatisfied and I think, why do I think about my neighbors the way I think about my neighbors? Give me a break. The question is, 
am I better than I used to be? See, it's back to that same issue we mentioned a minute ago. Our lives have to change. Can I go back and repair the damage of the past? Maybe a little, but I can't undo it. The choices that I made went under those fruits, up, I mean the works of the flesh, can I go back and undo those? No. I can apologize. I can say I'm sorry, but I can't undo it. Once the word's out of my mouth, it's done. Once the act is done, it's done. Once I've attended a party and got drunk as a skunk, I can't undo that. God may spare me from some of the consequences. How many people do you know? I know a bunch of them that say that's the way I used to be, but I'm not that way any longer. See, that's the work of the, fle work of the, of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit working in our life. I want to encourage you this morning. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And my prayer for you is that you never, never, never get satisfied with who you are in Jesus. I pray that God's Spirit continually convicts you to say, I want to be more kind. Why did I, we're used to you and even given it a thought. It's a process. Begin with this point. How do you do it? We'll deal with it more next week. But here's where we began. John 15. You remember John 15? We went through John 15 a year or two ago. Jesus is in his last 24 hours or less, before, he's less than a few, very few, handful of hours, one, hand, one set of fingers minus a few, before he'll be arrested. And what does he say? Remember we talked about John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, or that very short period of time in Jesus' life where he boils all the essentials together. The most important of the important of the important, and this is what he says. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that does, cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. You must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you will do nothing. And he goes on to talk about that. I personally believe, the older that I get, I personally believe that the fruit of the Spirit, that concept of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, how do, what does it look like? How does it work? How do I do that? It's very, very, very extremely simple, but it's extremely complicated. If I want to be like that, if I want that fruit of the Spirit in my life, the answer is as simple as this. Keep my eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Zach, that's it. If I want to be more godly, if I want these fruits of the Spirit to be more in my life, we talked about last week that that concept is sanctification, of becoming more holy, become more like Jesus day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. It's a decision by decision by decision. But I can't do it. I can want it, but I can't do it. If I keep my eyes on Jesus, apart from me, Jesus said in John 15, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me, you will become more fruitful. Those agricultural examples, right? Think about it a minute. Well, this is rocket science, right? If you have a tomato plant and you pull it up, how many tomatoes is it going to produce? You have a tomato plant and you break off a limb where it can put it and they don't work. Is that what we're trying to do? Are we trying to become like Jesus apart from him? We've disconnected ourselves from him and tied into something else, some other theology, some other philosophy, some other theory, and we wonder why our lives are drying up. I would be so bold to say this morning, that every individual, every individual that began a relationship with Jesus and they're no longer in that relationship, that's what's happened. They have removed themselves 
from the vine. Choice by choice, decision by decision, consequence by consequence, they're gone. They've been cut off because they were not fruitful. How do we do it? It's that simple. But boy, is it hard. You mean to tell me, David, you mean to tell me that all I have to do is fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, and these things will be multiplied in my life. Yeah, that's right. But, but, tomorrow, when I get up, tomorrow, all day long, I choose. Now, I can say whatever I want to. I choose not to pray. I choose not to read God's Word. I refuse to meditate on what God has done for me. I choose to find the negative in life instead of the positive in life. Whatever the reason, that's your choice. God loves you enough to do that. But if you want these attributes in your life, it's that simple. Just begin tomorrow. Begin today. I may have shared with you before, it doesn't have anything to do with this per se. It had to do with learning Greek words. God told me one time, he said, put them on three by five note cards, put them in your car on the sun visor, and every time you stop at a red light, flip your sun visor down and read that word and tie it to the word. You'll learn it that way. Years ago, some of you know, some of you don't, doesn't matter, I was in a quart male quartet. Four of us sang songs. You know how I learned all those songs we sang? Three by five no note card stuck on the sun visor. Every time I got at a red light, I'd sing that song through. Now, I realize every once in a while, Greg will honk at you and say, let's get going. Realize that. It's as simple as that. Find something. One of those refrigerator verses I make reference to. Find something. Put it on a three-by-five note card. Put it in your car on a sun visor. And every time, even in Lovington, there's only four lights. I realize that. Read it. And I'm telling you. If you read Philippians 4.13, for an example, I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. If you read that over and over and over and over in a day's time, it may take a week. If you're stubborn like me, it may take four or five years. Eventually, you're going to believe it. Eventually, you can put in your car, Philippians 4.8, Whatever is pure, noble, etc. Think on these things. So you have a weapon against the chaos of the world. What am I thinking about? How do I have more peace, more love? It depends on what I'm thinking about. If I think on these things and realize I can do these things in Jesus, my life changes. If you want to be the husband that you want to be but you can't do it, begin to start reading what God says. Paul says what? Love your wife to the same degree that Jesus loved the church, that he'd be willing to lay down his life. And do you think the remote control is going to become really important to you after that? Do you think, in fact, Corey's here this morning. He kind of grinned at me this morning. I'm, Chris is on my case, so I'm not going to talk to Chris. You really think, Corey, if somebody wants to visit with you over a cup of coffee and you don't watch the Cowboys, the score is going to be the same? It's going to be the same. I already made reference that, you know, they kind of kind of need to be like New Texas. If Denver City still plays Lovington in football and Lovington moves all of their stuff to the fall, maybe, maybe Denver City can win because there's nobody to play. Same with the Cowboys. The odds are less they're going to win. But anyway, where's my mind? Where am I thinking? What's most important to me? You see how that works? The fruit of the Spirit, I keep my eyes on Jesus, and Jesus changes my life. I keep my eyes on me, and my life is a wreck, and it becomes much worse day by day. Look at our world today. Look at our world today. Which group do you want to participate in? Those that are tearing everything up and burning everything down? Why are they doing that? You got the answer, don't you? The works of the flesh. Why don't people participate in that? Because of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, unfinished. Song by Mandisa. Did I say it right this time? I used to say Man Man Water. I'm not scared to say it. I used to be the one preaching it to you that you could overcome. I still believe it, but it isn't easy. Because that wor world I painted where things just all work out, it started changing and I started having doubts. 
and it got me so down. I know his history and the kind of God he is. He, he's might, he might make it a mystery, but he's proving that I can trust him, and yeah, I believe it. So I picked myself back up, and I started telling me, no, my God's not done making me a masterpiece. He's still working on me. He started something good, and I'm going to believe it. He started something good, and he's going to complete it. So I celebrate the truth. His work in me isn't through. I'm just finished. He's unfinished. He's still working, still working on me. That's good news. We keep our eyes on Jesus. There's never going to be a time he says, I'm done with him. I'm fed up. I've forgiven him the last time. He's pro That's never going to happen. He who began a good work in you, Philippians, is faithful to bring it to completion. Keep our eyes on Jesus, and those fruit of the Spirit will multiply and expand in our life. Again, we'll deal more with that next week as to how some more of the, the nuts and bolts, for lack of a better term, but hopefully you get the picture today. If you have a need in your life, if we can help you this morning in any way, and we invite you to come as Josh leads us in this song. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Good morning. I will be reading Jude 17 through 21. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who, who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by the building by building yourselves up in, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for mercy of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, at this time we humbly bow our heads in prayer, asking you to be with each one of us as we are preparing to depart from this place. Help us to be Christ-like and to be the light of the world as we continue our lives. So be with, be with each one of us as we try to perfect our lives and to be better Christians. Be with those that are ill. Give them that health that they mostly want. Be with our leaders in this nation to guide us uh, guide us in the right way help them to see that the church is essential to each one of us so help us to 
consider that and to be better Christians in Christ. We pray. Amen.